God. His goodness is beyond our goodness. And even sometimes when we don't understand why things happen in our lives, God is still good. And He's never unjust. And whatever He does is right. We believe goodness of God. The goodness of God. Wow. His goodness never is. Well, we've been going through this series in uh, Acts called Spreading the Gospel. And uh, we're going to be in Acts 2. We're going to finish Acts 2 today. But in Spreading the Gospel, we know that we are called to be witnesses. Uh, Acts 1.8 says, but as... Uh, but." Uh, let me read it out of, out of the Bible here because uh, for some reason it's not coming in. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what we're called to do. All of us are called to be witnesses to the resurrection. And today we're going to talk about the power of the Spirit. How the, the Spirit of God demonstrates His power and how that works in us. The, the, the Spirit fills us and we're empowered to be witnesses because of that feeling. And He demonstrates His power through our witnessing. I want to start with a story. And there's a story of a, a man named Herbert Jackson who was in a seminary class and as a new missionary, he was assigned this car. And this car wouldn't start, though, without a push. You remember those? I remember when I was in college, we had a car, you had to push, and you'd pop the clutch, and you could get it started. Some of y'all may be familiar with what I'm talking about. Well, that was kind of the situation with Herbert Jackson, that he had this car, wouldn't stop. But after he worked on this problem, he, he devised a plan what he would do. So he would, he would go to school and, and get get permission to get children out of school, and they would push his car off and help him get it started. Well, and as he made his rounds, he would either park on a hill or he'd just leave it running. And that way, he, he would be okay. He wouldn't have to restart his car. Well, he got ill. And so after a couple of years of doing that, he, he, he got ill, couldn't continue to do that. And so another missionary came to the station. And, and when... Jackson met this new missionary. He began to tell him his arrangement of, of getting about, you know, with his car. And he, he'd come up with this ingenious plan, you know, get the children, help them push it off and all this, and he'd park it on the hill. And as he was talking, the new missionary popped the hood and looked under there, and he said, wait a minute, Mr. Jackson, just look at here. Here's a loose cable right here. And so he said, um, he gave it a twist, and he stepped in the car, turned the starter, and it fired right up. And so, uh, you know, sometimes the power is there, and we don't even know it. And so Jackson was just astonished. Uh, the power was there all the time, but only a loose connection just prevented that car from starting on its own. Just need a little bit of attention. That's the power that you and I have. We are energized by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our worship is energized by the power of the Holy Spirit but we have to access it. It's there. But there are many, I believe there are many Christians and many churches today that are not operating under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to see here the, uh, the work of the disciples and what, what, what God was doing with the Holy Spirit and, 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 and demonstrating His power. And my question today is, are we accessing that power? Or, or, or do we realize we have spiritual power? That as a believer in Christ, you have power. And are you accessing that? Are you using that power? Do you realize that you have spiritual power in your life? It's available to us. And so, so are we going to go about our lives struggling to be witnesses when all the time we've got power available to us? We just got to access it. So, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, we are the church, and we are supposed to be witnessing. So, our scripture is Acts 2, in chapter 2, verse 37. We're going to finish the chapter today. And I'm not going to start by reading this. I'm just going to start with 
the first verse there in verse 37. So we know that they were filled with the Spirit, and Peter was filled, filled with the Spirit. He begins preaching to the people, and he told the crowd, These Jews are not drunk that you see, but what you see is just a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And they were filled with the Spirit. He begins preaching his first sermon, proclaiming that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the truth. And he was the one that they had crucified. He told them that you're the one who put Jesus on the cross. And so he said that Jesus is the Messiah, he is Lord, the one we, we talked about him being Lord last week. And he's Lord in that he had conquered death, and every enemy of his is defeated and will be defeated in the future. Because there's coming a day when there are going to be some enemies to rise up against Jesus, but Jesus will defeat his enemies. Jesus is Lord right now this morning. So that's the message that Peter, Peter preached to the people. And so as he, he gave this message, he, he said that um, in verse 37, when the people had heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted. They were pierced in their heart. And they wanted to know, what do we do? Their conscience was Wounded, if you will, or they, they needed help, they said. They, they, they understood that. It wasn't just something they knew in their head, but they felt it also in their heart. There's some people that way. They don't have a mental sense. They believe in their head, but their heart's not really there. Or maybe it's just an emotional thing that they go through and it passes. So they, they wanted to know what they must do. What are we going to do? And, and when a person is like that, when a person is under conviction, they're going to show signs of that. There's going to be some, some feelings of remorse. Uh, there's going to be some feelings emotionally. Uh, and that says that they realize they're in the wrong and that they need forgiveness. And that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is working in that person when they show those signs. Well, that's what these people were doing. They were convicted. They were cut to the heart. But it was the work of the Spirit. It wasn't the great message that Peter had preached. He told them the truth. He gave them the truth. But it was God's work. It wasn't what Peter was doing or his ingenuity. It was the Spirit at work. He told them about Jesus' life, that he gave proof that Jesus was the Messiah. He told them about his miracles and all the great things that he had done in feeding multitudes of people and raising the dead even. And he told them about Jesus' death and his resurrection. So he gave all of that to them, and that's what we do. We tell people about those things about Jesus. We tell them the truth of the Bible. And so Peter's, Peter's words cut them to the heart. They were cut to the heart deeply. They knew they needed, uh, they needed help. And the Holy Spirit was the power and the principal agent in this causing the conviction of these people. Why were they convicted? Well... Maybe it was because they felt guilty knowing they're the ones who had crucified Jesus. That's what Peter said, said and, and, in verse uh, 36. If you go back one verse, it says, This Jesus whom you crucified, he said, you're the one that did this. Maybe they felt guilty because of that. Or maybe they were feeling like, I mean, he had talked about the prophecy of Joel about the day of the Lord that's coming, and maybe they were convicted about that, knowing that this day in the future is coming, and I don't know if I'm ready for that day in the future. Maybe they were convicted because of that. Those are reasons that people may be convicted now to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's because of my sin and your sin that caused Jesus to have to go to the cross. He paid for your sin and my sin. He died for the whole world. Or maybe we realize that in the future there's a day coming when we're going to stand before Jesus and give him the count. That's really a, a part of my testimony is as a young boy, I, I was afraid of dying. I thought, what's going to happen to me when I die? And you may have had those feelings. I guess we all think that way, but as a young boy, I thought, what's going to happen to me? Because I've been to church. I told you I was one of those drug babies. I was drugged to church. And they, you know, they taught the Bible, and I learned in Sunday school and, and in preaching that, you know, I needed Jesus and that. 
we were dying, we were going to go somewhere after we died. And that was a fear for me. So maybe we, 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 we uh, have a fear of what's going to happen to us after death. And so that was, that was my fear, but people are that way. Maybe these Jews thought, okay, I'm not ready for the future. I want to be ready. And so they said, what must we do? So they, uh, they, they, desired, they desired Peter to help them. So they were convicted, whatever the reason was, and they wanted to get right with God. Now that's the result we desire when we share the gospel with someone. We want the Holy Spirit to speak to them through our sharing, and we want the Spirit to do the convicting. We want the Spirit to call them, and we want them to see their need to receive Jesus. So we tell them about Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection, and that He is Lord. And we let them deal with it. We let the Spirit of God uh, speak to them. We can tell them they're guilty of causing Jesus to be crucified. We can say that. Your, your sin and my sin, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. We can share that. But ultimately, in, 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 in witnessing, we have to let the Spirit work. When you're trying to talk with someone... You have to wait on the Spirit. Because if, if the Spirit's not at work, that person's not going to respond. They're most likely going to reject you. You want to be praying for that person. You want that person, before you go to talk to them, to have God's Spirit already working in their life. So you build a relationship with people and you pray for them. Those are two ingredients as far as being a witness. So it has to be the Spirit. And God wants to use us. But God can't use our silence. If we're silent, God can't use that. He wants us to speak up. So the Spirit worked through Peter, was demonstrating his power, and the Spirit can work through you and me as well. But we've got to be filled with the Spirit, like Peter, before we can speak up. Don't go try to do spiritual work if you're not living a Christian life yourself. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, and it takes you reading the Bible and praying and being in worship and coming to church and fellowshipping with the body of Christ, it takes that. So you have to pray for people that you're going to be witnessing to. And you have to be an obedient believer yourself. You have to pray for the encounters you have every day and you be ready to share with people because you don't know. <clears throat> you don't know when you're going to have an encounter. This past Monday, I, I had that same situation. I was, uh, you all know about, <clears throat> I think I've told most of you, that my truck died. And so I'm looking for a new truck, or another truck, not necessarily a new one. Uh, trucks are high, cars are high, period, right? But I was, I was looking at a truck, talking to the guy, and, uh, and uh, told him that I was a pastor, and began to ask him some spiritual questions. And as I did, I, I found out that he was a believer. And so uh, I had the opportunity to, to witness to him there. So it, it, it just takes you being obedient, being willing to stop and share when you, when you have that opportunity because you don't know when that's going to happen. And sometimes the, the devil will in the back of your mind, which I did, it's like, well, I probably need to just go on. I need to get, get home. But Sometimes you have to wait. You have to stop. <clears throat> or maybe there's an interruption of your day or what you're doing. You have to be willing to stop as you go. Well, these people were cut to the heart. They were pierced. And Peter said to and they, and they said, what shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he issues this call to receive Christ. He proclaims, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. So he tells the people, in order for you to be forgiven or what to do to be made right with God, you need to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. Now what is repentance? And we've talked about that in the past. Well, it means a change in direction in your life. It's as if you're going in one direction, you're living your life one way, and then you turn, or you repent, and you begin to live differently. 
opposite of the way you were living. So when you come to Christ, there should be a turning away from sin. And you turn to Christ. You turn away from yourself and turn to Jesus. And you start living the way Jesus wants you to live. So you, you want to follow everything that Jesus said from that point. And you can't come to Christ, but then continue to live the same old way you've been living. And I think there are people that want to do that. They just want to add Jesus to their life. You don't just add Jesus to your life. He becomes your very life. When you accept Jesus, He is your life. You don't just add Him and put Him in there and then live life the way you've always lived. No, He changes everything. When you come to Christ, He becomes your Lord. He's your Master and you want to do everything Jesus says. So it demonstrates, repentance demonstrates that you are giving your life to Jesus, and you want to submit to Him. You're placing your faith in Him. And it demonstrates you're more than just sorry for your sin. That's just an emotional thing. If you're just sorry. We should be sorry. But it should be more than that. There should be a change of life. And in Matthew 3, verse 2, um, John the Baptist said this. He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Even before Jesus gained his popularity, this was a baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was preaching. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in Mark, chapter 6, verse 12, it says the disciples, these 12 disciples were sent out as they went out and they preached that people are to repent. And in Acts 3.19, it says, therefore repent, be converted or return so that your sins may be blotted out or wiped away so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So there's this biblical response to repent. That's what Peter was saying. If you don't repent, then you've really not been saved. Now, I hate to say that, but I believe that's the truth. Sometimes we want to tell people, well, you just want to add Jesus. You just want to believe in Jesus. That's true. But there's more than that. You've got to... Uh, you've got to admit your sin and believe that Jesus is God's Son, but you admit and you repent. You turn away from your sin. That's vital. You have to repent. So uh, we are told to do that. Matthew uh, 3 talks about baptism. We have to repent and be baptized. What is baptism? Well, baptism means a water baptism by immersion. We believe in baptism by immersion. There are other faiths, other denominations believe in sprinkling or pouring or different types of baptism. We believe in believer's baptism. That you are a believer, then you are baptized. That's the order that we believe. So it's a picture, a visible demonstration of you doing just what Jesus did. When Jesus died, he was buried. And he rose again. That's what you're saying in the pool. Say, I'm identifying with Jesus. I'm being baptized in his name. That I am dying in my old way of life. And I'm buried with Jesus in baptism. And I'm raised again to walk in newness of life. That's what baptism is. In, uh, in Matthew 3, verse 11, it says, As for me, this is John the Baptist speaking, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus was coming, and he was going to bring the Holy Spirit to baptize people. And Jesus was baptized himself. And if Jesus is baptized, then I feel like I ought to be baptized as well. Because Jesus said, to be baptized. Matthew 28, 19 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has commanded us to go and baptize people after they believe, after they become a disciple. So repentance and baptism are important. One more verse, 1 Peter 3, 21 says this, Corresponding to that, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So we are baptized in the name of Jesus. It identifies with his death and burial and resurrection. And it shows you believed in Jesus and you've placed your faith in Jesus. Well, Peter told the people what they had witnessed could happen in their lives. And if they would believe, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as well. They would be forgiven and they would become a believer. They would become a part of the church. So what they must do is repent and be baptized. And that's what we're to tell others. Now, I don't necessarily advocate you going out and telling people, you need to repent, you need to repent. Don't do that. That might not be well accepted if you tell people that. But that's basically what we want to get to, is to say, look at the life you're living now. How's that working out for you? <laughs> well, for most people outside of Christ, it's not working very good. Now, some people can look good on the outside, especially in the wedding the community where I live. I mean, there's people that are well off. They work in shop. They make a lot of money. They live on the outskirts in the bedroom communities, and they think life's just fine. But I'm telling you, I've met some of them got a lot of money on houses, but inwardly and emotionally, they're a wreck. They're hurting. And so uh, everybody needs the gospel, and it takes repentance and baptism and and we need to get to that. And we've talked about how we do that on Wednesday nights. How do we share the gospel without being afraid to do it? There's a way to do it. Well, we're called to get to that point. And, and they, you know, we can issue a call, you know, like Peter, we can tell people about church. Oh, we need you to come into the church. Or won't you be a part of our church? That's nice. That's good. We want people to become a part of the church. And we can tell them, oh, you're living in sin. And look what this is going to lead to. or What's going to happen to you or your family because of the way you're living and your lifestyle? We can tell them about all that. But we need to get to the point of saying, are you ready to receive Christ into your life? That's the issue. That's the main thing. We can preach about life all we want, but we've got to get to the gospel, which says, repent. Turn away from your life and believe the gospel and be baptized, showing that you are a follower of Christ. That's what Peter said to do. So, and there may be people here this morning who say, well, I've never, I've never repented, I've never admitted to Jesus that I'm a sinner. You may never ever ask him in your life. Or you may, you may not have been baptized. If you haven't, then you need to do that. In obedience to Christ. We don't, we don't have an option. Jesus commanded us to baptize. And we need to repent and turn to Him. There's no other way. And if you need to accept Christ, I'd love to talk to you. After the service or any time, if you need to be baptized, I urge you to come and talk to me. I would say if, if a Christian has never been baptized but they're a professing Christian, they're living in disobedience. Now, I don't say that to condemn you. I say that in love. I believe that if you're a believer in Christ, that you should have identified with Christ by being baptized. Let's go on. Verse 39. Peter says that this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So Peter says it's for you, your children, future descendants, and whoever God will call. Who do we share the gospel with? Everybody. Because everybody needs it. And Jesus has died for all, and he says all people need the gospel. And that's what, uh, and that's what our verse says. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the whole world. So we share the gospel with everybody, but the Holy Spirit has to be the one that draws them. The Holy Spirit has to be the one that calls them. And I believe if a person will call out to God, God will hear. God will respond. But some people will reject, and when they do, when they reject, it's like, it's like Pharaoh. Their heart becomes harder and harder as we do that. So the gospel goes out for everyone. Everybody needs Jesus. God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, 
And after that, the judgment. So we are all going to stand before Jesus, whether we're a believer or not. We're going to stand before Jesus and give an account of this life, how we lived it. And have we responded to the gospel, or have we rejected it? We're all responsible. And it's for everybody. Peter says that in verse 39. Back in verse 21, if you go up to verse 21, it says what? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. What did I say last week? All means all. All who can't call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Verse 40, it says, With many other signs and words, Peter preached um, uh, more than what we have here. And so um, many other words, things that Peter would say to them. And he said, Be saved from this perverse generation. This is a terrible world we live in. It seems like it's getting worse and worse, doesn't it? This is a perverse world we live in. I mean, it's just odd. And uh, so many things that we, we as Christians deal with, and we're being persecuted because we don't want to we don't want to believe that I and have to exercise or be desensitized to our beliefs to follow everybody else in this world. No, I, I believe that as Christians we have the right to exercise our faith. And I believe. And don't tell me how to exercise my faith out in public. I'm not just going to be a Christian in this building. I'm going to be a Christian out there as well. And so this is a perverse world. And we, we need a Savior. And we, we don't want to be uh, afraid of exercising our faith. Verse 41 says, Peter... Those who received this word were baptized. And that day there was about 3,000 souls added. <coughs> 3,000, what a number. It's because the Spirit was at work. The Spirit was demonstrating His power. Boy, I wish we'd have a big revival of people that would come to Christ. I wish we had that. I'm praying for that. But it takes prayer. It takes us calling out to God and saying, We need your power. We need the Holy Spirit. It's available. We have to access it. The Spirit's power is available. Well, verse 40, 41, it says, They received His Word. They were baptized. They wanted it. They chose it. They received the Gospel. And when the Gospel was proclaimed, thousands of people responded. We just have to be obedient to do that. Now, I'm not saying that the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to work today just like He did before. No, we're not going to put God in a box and say, okay, this is the way God works. I mean, each church, each situation can be different for how the Spirit works in a church. But we need to be obedient, and I believe as we do that, God's Spirit will honor what we do in sharing the gospel and in reaching out to people. Well, the Spirit's power was seen in the church. We see that in verse 42. The, the, uh, they, were, they were continuing to meet together, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to a fellowship, breaking the bread and the prayer. And they were united. Um, they, they, they had this fellowship. They wanted to support each other. To, uh, they were devoted to the apostles. They, they wanted to learn. There were people had come and they found out about Jesus and they responded to the gospel here. They wanted to learn more. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching who had spent these three years with Jesus. They wanted to learn from them. And to the uh, fellowship. Now that fellowship is more than just us getting together and eating some fried chicken. That fellowship was that they came together and they would help each other. That they, it, it wasn't, it was like we can help you meet your needs. And as I said, people had come into town from these 15 people groups. They needed food immediately so they could eat. They wanted to stay there and learn from the apostles, so they needed help. Well, this fellowship provided for those needs. It was a koinonia. You've heard of that word koinonia. And it was uh, an intimacy that they had with each other. It's like when, in, in the old days, we'd give people the right hand of fellowship. I mean, you may know what I'm talking about. The right hand of fellowship is when somebody makes a decision, they come forward, and we, 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 we issue the right hand of fellowship, and everybody comes by and shakes their hand and says, we're glad you're here, and we are going to support you spiritually, and you are now a part of our church, and we want you to reciprocate as well. So that's what fellowship was. It was a koinonia that they came together 
to uh, meet the physical needs of people. Well, the breaking of bread refers to the Lord's Supper, and they were observing the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They were praying. They were praying in their homes. They were praying in the temple. And verse 43 says they were feeling a sense of awe. Awesome things were happening. <clears throat> there was wonders and signs in verse 43 we see that they were having. And if you go through the book of Acts, you see that the Spirit of God was, was doing all of these things. The Spirit was demonstrating His power in all the things that was happening in the book of Acts. That's why we just call the Acts of the Apostles because of, <clears throat> of the miracles that were occurring. Well, thirdly, the Spirit's power brings unity. In verse 44 and 45, it says, All of those who had believed were together. They were unified. They were working together as a church. They loved each other. They had all things in common, it says. They were committed in several ways. They had a common Lord, one Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the one that this church is about. That's what they were saying. They were committed to Him. And their relationship to Him was the most important thing to them. They were uh, bound to a common experience because Jesus was their Savior. And they, were, they had a common fund that, that uh, they had as possessions. Many were selling possessions and contributing them to the church and being given as proceeds to the church. Now, it wasn't a, a socialism. Socialism, well, th what this was was that what belongs to me belongs to you. They were saying, I want to give to the people in this church. I will support it. And I'm going to do that voluntarily. Socialism says, what's yours is mine. Think of it that way. That's what socialism says. Whatever belongs to you, it's really mine. And you need to give it to me or you need to help me because that's your responsibility. Because you have more than I do, so you need to give to me. That's what socialism says. But this is not socialism. This was, I have something and I want to give to you. And I want to help you. That's what they were doing at the church. So they were giving their uh, contributions voluntarily, not under compulsion. Well, how are you serving the church? Are you giving to the church? Are you seeking, as they were following the apostles' teaching, breaking bread, fellowship? How is, how is your participation? Think about how you are part of the church. Well, they were united. It says, they began, verse 45, uh, we, we read part of that, they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. 46 says, day by day, continuing with one another, with one mind, <coughs> in the temple and breaking bread. From house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Day by day, they couldn't get enough. They wanted to be together, and they were glad to do it. It was a great fellowship that they had. I want our church, and I, know, I hope all churches would be this way, but I want it to be where we would be glad when they say, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to church on Sunday. I don't want our church to ever to feel like, well, I got to go to church I got to get up out of the bed. I got to go down there, put on a good face, all that. I, I want church to be a joy. And they had gladness to be a part of the church. And they were sharing and fellowshipping together. I want church to be unified. And as we are unified, that will build what I call community. Unity builds community. We have to be unified before we can build a community a community of faith and believers who are in fellowship and who love each other and are supporting each other and are working together. Verse 47 says, And they were praising God and they were having favor with all the people. And you see, their influence was spreading. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, who was adding to the church? It was the Lord. The Lord was added to the church. It wasn't them. It wasn't their ingenuity, their words. But God 
uh, or Jesus said, you are to go. You have to go. And as you are going, you are to share the gospel with people. But the Spirit has to do the work. It's spiritual work. Understand that. And you have to have the Spirit in your life before you can share that with somebody else. So today, the invitation is for you to understand that the Spirit has power. And He's demonstrating that power. But you and I have to access it. It's there. But if we don't, we don't partake of that, then we don't have that power. How do we partake of that? We pray for that. Ask for the Spirit. Our Father wants to give good things to those who choose, choose to love Him. And He will answer that prayer. And we will see that in our lives individually as we share our faith with other people. We'll see it in, in the church. As our church begins to, to exercise the Spirit in each of our lives, we'll see uh, our, our fellowship growing and, and unifying ultimately. The Spirit's power will bring unity. And I believe there's unity here. I've been in churches where there's not unity. I've been in churches where I was ready to go because there were issues that I just wasn't happy with. And I thought, okay, God, if you open the door, I'll go. And sometimes God will let me go. I'm glad to be here. I know the Holy Spirit to work in our church. I want to see those baptism waters back there parted. I want us to see people repenting and coming to Christ and baptizing people. But we got to share. we got to go. And it's not just the pastor, it's all of us. And I want to help you learn to do that. How do you share this thing? Let's close our eyes and stand. Let's prepare for a time of invitation.